Of course they're broke. Would you have a motorcycle if it wasn't important to you? Of course not. Would you have a pet parrot if it wasn't important to you? Of course not. In the same way, if you don't think money is important, you simply won't have any. You can actually dazzle your friends with this insight. Imagine you're in a conversation with a friend who tells you, money's not important. Put your hand on your forehead and look up as though you're getting a message from the heavens. Then exclaim, you're broke. To which your shocked friend will undoubtedly respond, how did you know? Then you stretch out your palm and you reply, what else do you want to know? That'll be 50 bucks, please. Let me put it bluntly. Anyone who says money isn't important doesn't have any. Rich people understand the importance of money and the place it has in our society. On the other hand, poor people validate their financial ineptitude by using irrelevant comparisons. They'll argue, well, money isn't as important as love. Now is that comparison dumb or what? What's more important, your arm or your leg? Maybe they're both important. Listen up, my friends. Money is extremely important in the areas in which it works and extremely unimportant in the areas in which it doesn't. And although love may make the world go round, it sure doesn't pay for the building of any hospitals, churches, or homes. It also doesn't feed anybody. Not convinced? Try paying your bills with love. Still not sure? Then pop on over to the bank and try depositing some love and see what happens. I'll save you the trouble. The teller will look at you as if you've just gone AWOL from the loony bin and scream only one word. Security! No rich people believe money is not important. And if I've failed to persuade you and you still somehow believe that money's not important, then I have only two words for you. You're broke. And you always will be until you eradicate that non-supportive file from your financial blueprint. Victim clue number three. Complaining. Complaining is the absolute worst possible thing you could do for your health or your wealth. The worst. Why? I'm a big believer in the universal law that states what you focus on expands. When you are complaining, what are you focusing on? What's right with your life or what's wrong with it? You are obviously focusing on what's wrong with it. And since what you focus on expands, you'll keep getting more of what's wrong. Many teachers in the personal development field talk about the law of attraction. It states that like attracts like, meaning that when you are complaining, you're actually attracting crap into your life. Wealth principle. When you are complaining, you become a living, breathing crap magnet. Have you ever noticed that complainers usually have a tough life? It seems that everything that could go wrong does go wrong for them. They say, of course I complain. Look how crappy my life is. And now that you know better, you can explain to them. No, it's because you complain that your life is so crappy. Shut up and don't stand near me. Which brings us to another point. You have to make darn sure not to put yourself in the proximity of complainers. If you absolutely have to be nearby, make sure you bring a steel umbrella or the crap meant for them will get you too. I stay as far away from complainers as possible because negative energy is infectious. Plenty of people, however, love to hang out and listen to complainers. Why? It's simple. They're waiting for their turn. You think that's bad? Wait till you hear what happened to me. Here's some homework that I promise will change your life. For the next seven days, I challenge you to not complain at all. Not just out loud, but in your head as well but you have to do it for the full seven days. Why? Because for the first few days, you may still have some residual crap coming to you from before. Unfortunately, crap doesn't travel at the speed of light, you know. It travels at the speed of crap. So it might take a while to clear out. I've given this challenge to thousands of people, and I'm blown away at how many of them have told me that this one teensy-weensy exercise has transformed their lives. I guarantee you'll be astonished at how amazing your life will be when you stop focusing on and thereby stop attracting crap into your life. If you've been a complainer, forget about attracting success for now. For most people, just getting to neutral would be a great start. Blame, justification, and complaining are like pills. They are nothing more than stress reducers. They alleviate the stress of failure. Think about it. If a person weren't failing in some way, shape, or form, 
would he or she need to blame, justify, or complain? The obvious answer is no. From now on, as you hear yourself disastrously blaming, justifying, or complaining, cease and desist immediately. Remind yourself that you are creating your life and that at every moment you will be attracting either success or crap into your life. It is imperative you choose your thoughts and words wisely. Now you're ready to hear one of the greatest secrets in the world. Are you ready? Listen carefully. There is no such thing as a really rich victim. Did you get that? I'll say it again. There is no such thing as a really rich victim. Besides, who would listen? Tsk, tsk, I got a scratch in my yacht. To which almost anyone would respond, who gives a hoot? Meanwhile, being a victim definitely has its rewards. What do people get out of being a victim? The answer is attention. Is attention important? You bet it is. In some form or another, it's what almost everyone lives for. And the reason people live for attention is that they've made a critical mistake. It is the same error that virtually all of us have made. We've confused attention with love. Believe me, it is virtually impossible to be truly happy and successful when you're constantly yearning for attention. Because if it's attention you want, you're at the mercy of others. You usually end up as a people pleaser, begging for approval. Attention seeking is also a problem because people tend to do stupid things to get it. It is imperative to unhook attention and love for a number of reasons. First, you will be more successful. Second, you will be happier. Third, you can find true love in your life. For the most part, when people confuse love and attention, they don't love each other in the true spiritual sense of the word. They love each other largely from the place of their own ego, as in, I love what you do for me. Therefore, the relationship is really about the individual and not about the other person, or at least the both of you. By disconnecting attention from love, you will be freed up to love another for who they are, rather than what they do for you. Now, as I said, there is no such thing as a rich victim. So to stay a victim, attention seekers make darn sure they never get rich. It's time to decide. You can be a victim or you can be rich, but you can't be both. Listen up. Every time, and I mean every time, you blame, justify, or complain, you are slitting your financial throat. Sure, it would be nice to use a kindler and gentler metaphor, but forget it. I'm not interested in kind or gentle right now. I'm interested in helping you see exactly what the heck you're doing to yourself. Later, once you get rich, we can be kinder and gentler. How's that? It's time to take back your power and acknowledge that you create everything that is in your life and everything that is not in it. Realize that you create your wealth, your non-wealth, and every level in between. Declaration. Place your hand on your heart and say, I create the exact level of my financial success. Touch your head and say, I have a millionaire mind. Millionaire Mind Actions 1. Every time you catch yourself blaming, justifying, or complaining, slide your index finger across your neck as a trigger to remind yourself that you are slitting your financial throat. Once again, even though this gesture may seem a little crude to do to yourself, it's no more crude than what you're doing to yourself by blaming, justifying, or complaining, and it will eventually work to alleviate these destructive habits. 2. Do a debrief. At the end of each day, write down one thing that went well and one thing that didn't. Then write the answer to the following question. How did I create each of these situations? If others were involved, ask yourself, what was my part in creating each of these situations? This exercise will keep you accountable for your life and make you aware of the strategies that are working for you and the strategies that are not. Special bonus. Go to www.millionairemindbook.com and click on free book bonuses to receive your free Millionaire Mind action reminders. Wealth file number two. Rich people play the money game to win. Poor people play the money game to not lose. Poor people play the money game on defense rather than offense. Let me ask you, if you were to play any sport or any game strictly on defense, what are the chances of your winning that game? Most people would agree, slim or none. 
Yet, that's exactly how many people play the money game. Their primary concern is survival and security instead of creating wealth and abundance. So what is your goal? What is your objective? What is your true intention? The goal of truly rich people is to have massive wealth and abundance. Not just some money, but lots of money. So what is the big goal of poor people? To have enough to pay the bills, and on time would be a miracle. Again, let me remind you of the power of intention. When your intention is to have enough to pay the bills, that's exactly how much you'll get. Just enough to pay the bills and not a dime more. Middle class people at least go a step further. Too bad it's a tiny step. Their big goal in life also happens to be their favorite word in the whole wide world. They just want to be comfortable. I hate to break the news to you, but there's a huge difference between being comfortable and being rich. I have to admit, I didn't always know that. But one of the reasons I believe I have the right to even write this book is that I've had the experience of being on all three sides of the proverbial fence. I've been extremely broke, as in having to borrow a dollar for gas for my car. But let me qualify that. First, it wasn't my car. Second, the dollar came in the form of four quarters. Do you know how embarrassing it is for an adult to pay for gas with four quarters? The kid at the pump looked at me as if I were some kind of vending machine robber and then just shook his head and laughed. I don't know if you can relate, but it was definitely one of my financial low points and unfortunately just one of them. Once I got my act together, I graduated to the level of being comfortable. Comfortable is nice. At least you go out to decent restaurants for a change. But pretty much all I could order was chicken. Now there's nothing wrong with chicken if that's what you really want, but often it's not. In fact, people who are only financially comfortable usually decide on what to eat by looking at the right-hand side of the menu, the price side. Are you set for earning $20,000 to $30,000 a year? $40,000 to $60,000? $75,000 to $100,000? $150,000 to $200,000? $250,000 a year or more? A few years ago, I had an unusually well-dressed gentleman in the audience during one of my two-hour evening seminars. When the seminar was complete, he came over and asked if I thought the three-day millionaire mind course could do anything for him, considering he was already earning $500,000 a year. I asked him how long he'd earned that kind of money. He responded, consistently for about seven years now. That was all I needed to hear. I asked him why he wasn't earning two million a year. I told him that the program was for people who wanted to reach their full financial potential and asked him to consider why he was stuck at half a million. He decided to come to the program. I got an email from him a year later that said, the program was incredible, but I made a mistake. I only reset my money blueprint to earn two million dollars a year as we discussed. I'm already there. So I'm attending the course again to reset it for earning 10 million a year. The point I want to make is that the actual amounts don't matter. What matters is whether you are reaching your full financial potential. I know many of you might be asking why on earth would anyone need that kind of money? First, the very question is not overly supportive to your wealth and is a sure sign you'll want to revise your money blueprint. Second, the main reason this gentleman wanted to earn massive amounts of money was to support his work as a huge donor to a charity that assists AIDS victims in Africa. So much for the belief that rich people are greedy. Let's go on. Are you programmed for saving money or for spending money? Are you programmed for managing your money well or mismanaging it? Are you set for picking winning investments or picking losers? You might wonder, how could whether or not I make money in the stock market or in real estate be part of my blueprint? Simple. Who picks the stock or the property? You do. Who picks when you buy it? You do. Who picks when you sell it? You do. I guess you've got something to do with the equation. I have an acquaintance in San Diego named Larry. Larry is a magnet when it comes to making money. He definitely has a high income blueprint but he has the kiss of death when it comes to investing his money. Whatever he buys drops like a rock. Would you believe his dad had the exact same problem? Duh. I keep in close touch with Larry so I can ask him for investment advice. It is always perfect. Perfectly wrong. Whatever Larry suggests, I go the other way. I love Larry. On the other hand, 
Notice how many other people seem to have what we termed earlier the Midas touch. Everything they get involved with turns to gold. Both the Midas touch and the kiss of death syndromes are nothing more than the manifestations of money blueprints. Once again, your money blueprint will determine your financial life and even your personal life. If you are a woman whose money blueprint is set for low, chances are you will attract a man who is also set for low so you can stay in your financial comfort zone and validate your blueprint. If you are a man who is set for low, chances are you will attract a woman who is a spender and gets rid of all your money so you can stay in your financial comfort zone and validate your blueprint. Most people believe the success of their business is primarily dependent on their business skills and knowledge, or at least their timing of the marketplace. I hate to be the one to break it to you, but that's la-la land, which is another way of saying, not a chance. How well your business does is a result of your money blueprint. You will always validate your blueprint. If you have a blueprint that is set for earning $100,000 a year, that's exactly how well the business will do enough to earn you about one hundred thousand dollars a year if you're a salesperson and your blueprint is set for earning fifty thousand dollars a year and somehow you make a huge sale that makes you ninety thousand dollars that year either the sale will cancel or if you do end up with the ninety thousand dollars get ready for a crummy year to follow to make up for it and bring you back to the level of your financial blueprint on the other hand if you're set for earning fifty thousand dollars and you've been in a slump for a couple of years don't worry you'll get it all back. You have to. It's the subconscious law of the mind and money. Someone in this position would probably walk across the street, get hit by a bus, and end up with exactly $50,000 a year in insurance. It's simple. One way or another, if you're set for $50,000 a year, eventually that's what you'll get. So again, how can you tell what your money blueprint is set for? One of the most obvious ways is to look at your results. Look at your bank account, look at your income, look at your net worth, look at your success with investments, look at your business success, look at whether you're a spender or a saver, look at whether you manage money well, look at how consistent or inconsistent you are, look at how hard you work for your money, look at your relationships that involve money. Is money a struggle or does it come to you easily? Do you own a business or do you have a job? Do you stick with one business or job for a long time or do you jump around a lot? Your blueprint is like a thermostat. If the temperature in the room is 72 degrees, chances are good that the thermostat is set for 72 degrees. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Is it possible that because the window is open and it is cold outside, the temperature in the room can drop to 65 degrees? Of course, but what will eventually happen? the thermostat will kick in and bring the temperature back to 72. Also, is it possible that because the window is open and it's hot outside, the temperature in the room can go up to 77 degrees? Sure it could, but what will eventually happen? The thermostat will kick in and bring the temperature back to 72. The only way to permanently change the temperature in the room is to reset the thermostat. In the same way, the only way to change your level of financial success permanently is to reset your financial thermostat, otherwise known as your money blueprint. You can try anything and everything else you want. You can develop your knowledge in business, in marketing, in sales, in negotiations, and in management. You can become an expert in real estate or the stock market. All of these are tremendous tools, but in the end, without an inner toolbox that is big enough and strong enough for you to create and hold on to large amounts of money, all the tools in the world will be useless to you. Once again, it's simple arithmetic. Your income can grow only to the extent that you do. Fortunately or unfortunately, your personal money and success blueprint will tend to stay with you for the rest of your life, unless you identify and change it. And that is exactly what we will continue to do in part two of this book and do even further with you at the Millionaire Mind Intensive Seminar. Remember that the first element of all change is awareness. Watch yourself, become conscious, observe your thoughts, your fears, your beliefs, your habits, your actions, and even your inactions. Put yourself under a microscope, study yourself. Most of us believe that we live our lives based on choice, not usually. Even if we're really enlightened, 
We might make just a few choices during the average day that reflect our awareness of ourselves in the present moment. But for the most part, we're like robots, running on automatic, ruled by our past conditioning and old habits. That's where consciousness comes in. Consciousness is observing your thoughts and actions so that you can live from true choice in the present moment rather than being run by programming from the past. By achieving consciousness, we can live from who we are today rather than who we were yesterday. In this way, we can respond appropriately to situations, tapping the full range and potential of our skills and talents, rather than inappropriately reacting to events driven by the fears and insecurities of the past. Once you are conscious, you can see your programming for what it is, simply a recording of information you received and believed in the past, when you were too young to know any better. You can see that this conditioning is not who you are, but who you learned to be. You can see that you are not the recording, but the recorder. You are not the content in the glass, but the glass itself. You are not the software, but the hardware. Yes, genetics may play a role, and yes, spiritual aspects may come into play, but much of what shapes who you are comes from other people's beliefs and information. As I suggested earlier, beliefs are not necessarily true or false, right or wrong, but regardless of their validity, beliefs are opinions that are passed around and around and then down from generation to generation to you. Knowing this, you can consciously choose to release any belief or way of being that is not supportive to your wealth, and you can replace it with one that is. In our course, we teach that no thought lives in your head rent-free. Each thought you have will either be an investment or a cost. It will either move you toward happiness and success or away from it. It will either empower you or disempower you. That's why it is imperative you choose your thoughts and beliefs wisely. Realize that your thoughts and beliefs aren't who you are, and they are not necessarily attached to you. As precious as you believe them to be, they have no more importance and meaning than you give them. Nothing has meaning except for the meaning you give it. Recall how at the beginning of this book I suggested you don't believe a word I say? Well, if you really want to take off in your life, don't believe a word you say. And if you want instant enlightenment, don't believe a thought you think. Meanwhile, if you're like most people, you're going to believe something, so you might as well adopt beliefs that support you, rich beliefs. Remember, thoughts lead to feelings, which lead to actions, which lead to results. You can choose to think and act like rich people do, and therefore create the results that rich people create. The question is, how do rich people think and act? That's exactly what you'll discover in part two of this book. If you want to change your financial life forever, read on. Declaration. Place your hand on your heart and say, I observe my thoughts and entertain only those that empower me. Touch your head and say, I have a millionaire mind. Success story from Rhonda and Bob Baines. From Rhonda and Bob Baines to T. Harv Ecker. Subject, We Feel Free. We went to the Millionaire Mind Intensive not really knowing what to expect. We were very impressed with the results. Before attending the seminar, we were having a lot of money problems. We never seemed to get ahead. We would continually be in debt and not know why. We would pay off our credit cards, usually from a large bonus at work, only to get back into debt within six months. It did not matter how much money we made. We were very frustrated and argued a lot. Then we attended Millionaire Mind. While listening to Harv, my husband and I kept squeezing each other's leg and smiling and looking at each other. We heard so much information that had us saying, No wonder! Oh, so that's why! Everything makes sense now. We were very excited. We learned how he and I think so differently when it comes to money. How he is a spender and how I am an avoider. What a horrible combination. After hearing the information, we stopped blaming each other and started understanding each other and ultimately started to appreciate and love each other more. It is almost a year later and we still do not argue about money. We just talk about what we learn. We are no longer in debt. In fact, we have money in savings, the first time in our 16-year relationship. Yeah! We now not only have money for our future, but we also have enough money for our normal everyday expenses, playing, 
education, long-term savings for a home, and we even have money to share and give away. It feels wonderful knowing that we can use money in those areas and not feel guilty because we allocated and dedicated it for that purpose. We feel free. Thank you very much, Harv. What would you like for dinner tonight, dear? I'll have this $7.95 dish. Let's see what it is. Surprise, surprise, it's the chicken. For the 19th time this week. When you're comfortable, you don't dare allow your eyes to look at the bottom of the menu, for if you did, you might come across the most forbidden words in the middle class dictionary. Market price. And even if you were curious, you'd never ask what the price actually is. First, because you know you can't afford it. Second, it's downright embarrassing when you know the waiter doesn't believe you when he tells you that the dish is $49 with side dishes extra and you say, you know what, for some reason, I have a real craving for chicken tonight. I have to say that for me personally, one of the best things about being rich is not having to look at the prices on the menu anymore. I eat exactly what I want to eat regardless of the price. I can assure you, I didn't do that when I was broke or comfortable. It boils down to this. If your goal is to be comfortable, chances are you'll never get rich. But if your goal is to be rich, chances are you'll end up mighty comfortable. One of the principles we teach in our program is, if you shoot for the stars, you'll at least hit the moon. Poor people don't even shoot for the ceiling in their house, and then they just wonder why they're not successful. Well, they just found out, you get what you truly intend to get. If you want to get rich, your goal has to be rich. Not to have enough to pay the bills and not just to have enough to be comfortable. Rich means rich. Declaration. Place your hand on your heart and say, My goal is to become a millionaire and more. Touch your head and say, I have a millionaire mind. Millionaire mind actions. 1. Write down two financial objectives that demonstrate your intention to create abundance, not mediocrity or poverty. Write play to win goals for your A. Annual income B. Net worth. Make these goals achievable with a realistic time frame, yet at the same time remember to shoot for the stars. 2. Go to an upscale restaurant and order a meal at market price without asking how much it costs. If funds are tight, sharing is acceptable. P.S. No chicken. Wealth file number three. Rich people are committed to being rich. Poor people want to be rich. Ask most people if they want to be rich, and they'd look at you as if you were crazy. Of course I want to be rich, they'd say. The truth, however, is that most people don't really want to be rich. Why? because they have a lot of negative wealth files in their subconscious mind that tell them there is something wrong with being rich. At our Millionaire Mind Intensive Seminar, one of the questions we ask people is, what are some of the possible negatives about being rich or trying to get rich? Here's what some people have to say. See if you can relate to any of these. What if I make it and lose it? Then I'll really be a failure. I'll never know if people like me for myself or for my money. I'll be at the highest tax bracket and have to give half my money to the government. It's too much work. I could lose my health trying. My friends and family will say, who do you think you are, and criticize me. Everyone's going to want a handout. I could be robbed. My kids could be kidnapped. It's too much responsibility. I'll have to manage all that money. I'll have to really understand investments. I'll have to worry about tax strategies and asset protection and have to hire expensive accountants and lawyers. Yuck, what a hassle. And on and on it goes. As I mentioned earlier, each of us has a wealth file inside the cabinet called our mind. This file contains our personal beliefs that include why being rich would be wonderful. However, for many people, this file also includes information as to why being rich might not be so wonderful. This means they have mixed internal messages about wealth. One part of them gleefully says, having more money will make life a lot more fun. But then another part screams, yeah, but I'm going to have to work like a dog. What fun is that? One part says, I'll be able to travel the world. Then the other part chirps in, yeah, and everyone in the world will want a handout. These mixed messages may seem innocent enough, but in reality, 
They are one of the major reasons most people never become rich. You can look at it like this. The universe, which is another way of saying higher power, is akin to a big mail order department. It is constantly delivering people, events and things to you. You order what you get by sending energetic messages out to the universe based on your predominant beliefs. Again, based on the law of attraction, the universe will do its best to say yes and support you. But if you have mixed messages in your file, the universe can't understand what you want. One minute, the universe hears that you want to be rich, so it begins sending you opportunities for wealth. But then it hears you say, rich people are greedy, so the universe begins to support you in not having much money. But then you think, having a lot of money makes life so much more enjoyable. So the poor universe, dazed and confused, restarts sending you opportunities for more money. The next day, you're in an uninspired mood, so you think, money's not that important. The frustrated universe finally screams, make up your frickin' mind. I'll get you what you want, just tell me what it is. The number one reason most people don't get what they want is that they don't know what they want. Rich people are totally clear that they want wealth. They are unwavering in their desire. They are fully committed to creating wealth. As long as it's legal, moral, and ethical, they will do whatever it takes to have wealth. Rich people do not send mixed messages to the universe. Poor people do. By the way, when you read that last paragraph, if a little voice inside your head said something to the effect of, rich people don't care if it's legal, moral, or ethical, you are definitely doing the right thing in reading this book. You'll soon find out what a detrimental way of thinking that is. Poor people have plenty of good reasons as to why getting and actually being rich might be a problem. Consequently, they are not 100% certain they really want to be rich. Their message to the universe is confusing. Their message to others is confusing. And why does all of this confusion happen? Because their message to themselves is confusing. Earlier, we talked about the power of intention. I know it might be hard to believe, but you always get what you want what you subconsciously want, not what you say you want. You might emphatically deny this and respond, that's crazy, why would I want to struggle? And my question for you is exactly the same. I don't know, why would you want to struggle? If you want to discover the reason, I invite you to attend the Millionaire Mind Intensive Seminar, where you will identify your money blueprint. The answer will be staring you in the face. Put bluntly, if you are not achieving the wealth you say you desire, there's a good chance it's because first, you subconsciously don't really want wealth, or second, you're not willing to do what it takes to create it. Let's explore this further. There are actually three levels of so-called wanting. The first level is, I want to be rich. That's another way of saying, I'll take it if it falls in my lap. Wanting alone is useless. Have you noticed that wanting doesn't necessarily lead to having? Notice also that wanting without having leads to more wanting. Wanting becomes habitual and leads only to itself, creating a perfect circle that goes exactly nowhere. Wealth does not come from merely wanting it. How do you know this is true? With a simple reality check. Billions of people want to be rich, relatively few are. The second level of wanting is, I choose to be rich. This entails deciding to become rich. Choosing is a much stronger energy and goes hand in hand with being responsible for creating your reality. The word decision comes from the Latin word desidere, which means to kill off any other alternatives. Choosing is better, but not best. The third level of wanting is I commit to being rich. The definition of the word commit is to devote oneself unreservedly. This means holding absolutely nothing back giving 100% of everything you've got to achieving wealth. It means being willing to do whatever it takes for as long as it takes. This is the warrior's way. No excuses, no ifs, no buts, no maybes. And failure is not an option. The warrior's way is simple. I will be rich or I will die trying. I commit to being rich. Try saying that to yourself. What comes up for you? For some, it feels empowering. For others, it feels daunting. Most people would never truly commit to being rich. If you ask them, would you bet your life that in the next 10 years you will be wealthy? Most would say, no way. 
That's the difference between rich people and poor people. It's precisely because people won't truly commit to being rich that they are not rich and most likely never will be. Some might say, Harv, what are you talking about? I work my butt off. I'm trying real hard. Of course I'm committed to being rich. And I would reply, that you're trying means little. The definition of commitment is to devote oneself unreservedly. The key word is unreservedly, which means you're putting everything, and I mean everything you've got, into it. Most people I know who are not financially successful have limits on how much they are willing to do, how much they are willing to risk, and how much they are willing to sacrifice. Although they think they're willing to do whatever it takes, upon deeper questioning, I always find they have plenty of conditions around what they are willing to do and not do to succeed. I hate to have to be the one to tell you this, but getting rich is not a stroll in the park. And anyone who tells you it is either knows a heck of a lot more than me or is a little out of integrity. In my experience, getting rich takes focus, courage, knowledge, expertise, 100% of your effort, a never-give-up attitude, and, of course, a rich mindset. You also have to believe in your heart of hearts that you can create wealth and that you absolutely deserve it. Again, what this means is that if you are not fully, totally, and truly committed to creating wealth, chances are you won't. Are you willing to work 16 hours a day? Rich people are. Are you willing to work seven days a week and give up most of your weekends? Rich people are. Are you willing to sacrifice seeing your family, your friends, and give up your recreations and hobbies? Rich people are. Are you willing to risk all your time, energy, and startup capital with no guarantee of returns? Rich people are. For a time, hopefully a short time, but often a long time, rich people are ready and willing to do all of the above. Are you? Maybe you'll be lucky and you won't have to work long or hard or sacrifice anything. You can wish for that, but I sure wouldn't count on it. Again, rich people are committed enough to do whatever it takes, period. It's interesting to note, however, that once you do commit, the universe will bend over backward to support you. One of my favorite passages is by explorer W.H. Murray, who wrote the following during one of the first Himalayan expeditions. Until one is committed, there is hesitancy, the chance to draw back, always ineffectiveness. Concerning all acts of initiative and creation, there is one elementary truth, the ignorance of which kills countless ideas and splendid plans, that the moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too. A whole stream of events issues from the decision, raising in one's favor all manner of unforeseen incidents, meetings, and material assistance, which no man could have dreamt would have come his way. In other words, the universe will assist you, guide you, support you, and even create miracles for you. But first, you have to commit. Declaration. Place your hand on your heart and say, I commit to being rich. Touch your head and say, I have a millionaire mind. Millionaire Mind Actions 1. Write a short paragraph on exactly why creating wealth is important to you. Be specific. 2. Meet with a friend or family member who is willing to support you. Tell that person you want to evoke the power of commitment for the purpose of creating greater success. Put your hand on your heart. Look that person in the eye and repeat the following statement. I, your name, do hereby commit to becoming a millionaire or more by the date. Tell your partner to say, I believe in you. Then you say, thank you. P.S. To strengthen your commitment, I invite you to commit directly to me at www.millionairemindbook.com. Then print out your commitment and post it on your wall. Part 2. The Wealth Files. 17 Ways Rich People Think and Act Differently from Poor and Middle Class People. In Part 1 of this book, we discussed the process of manifestation. Recall that thoughts lead to feelings, feelings lead to actions, and actions lead to results. Everything begins with your thoughts, which are produced by your mind. Isn't it amazing that our mind is pretty much the basis for our life? And yet most of us have no clue as to how this powerful apparatus functions. 
So, let's start by taking a simple look at how your mind works. Metaphorically, your mind is nothing more than a big file cabinet, similar to what you'd find in your office or home. All information that comes in is labeled and filed in folders so that it's easy to retrieve to help you survive. Did you hear that? I didn't say thrive, I said survive. In every situation, you go to the files of your mind to determine how to respond. Say, for example, you're considering a financial opportunity. You automatically go to your file labeled money and from there decide what to do. The only thoughts you can have about money will be what are stored in your money file. That's all you can think about because that's all that's in your mind under that category. You decide based on what you believe is logical, sensible and appropriate for you at the time. You make what you think is the right choice. The problem, however, is that your right choice may not be a successful choice. In fact, what makes perfect sense to you may consistently produce perfectly poor results. For instance, let's say my wife is in the mall. That shouldn't be too hard for me to imagine. She sees this green purse. It's on sale for 25% off. She immediately goes to her mind files with the question, should I get this purse? In a nanosecond, her mind files come back with the answer. You've been looking for a green purse to go with those green shoes you bought last week. Plus, it's just the right size. Buy it. As she rushes to the checkout counter, her mind is not only thrilled that she's going to have this beautiful purse, but glowing with pride that she got it for 25% off. To her mind, this purchase makes perfect sense. She wants it, she believes she needs it, and it is such a deal. However, at no point did her mind come up with the thought, True, this is a really nice purse, and true, this is a great deal, but right now I'm $3,000 in debt, so I'd better hold off. She didn't come up with that information because no file in her head contains that. The file of, when you're in debt, don't buy anymore, was never installed in her and doesn't exist, which means that particular choice is not an option. Do you catch my drift? If you've got files in your cabinet that are non-supportive to financial success, those will be the only choices you can make. They'll be natural, automatic, and make perfect sense to you. But in the end, they will still produce financial failure or mediocrity at best. Conversely, if you've got mind files that support financial success, you will naturally and automatically make decisions that produce success. You won't have to think about it. Your normal way of thinking will result in success, kind of like Donald Trump. His normal way of thinking produces wealth. When it comes to money, wouldn't it be incredible if you could inherently think how rich people think? I sure hope you said absolutely, or something to that effect. Well, you can. As we stated previously, the first step to any change is awareness. Meaning the first step to thinking the way rich people think is to know how rich people think. Rich people think very differently from poor and middle class people. They think differently about money, wealth, themselves, other people, and pretty well every other facet of life. In part two of this book, we're going to examine some of these differences and, as part of your reconditioning, install 17 alternative wealth files into your mind. With new files come new choices. You can then catch yourself when you're thinking like poor and middle class people and consciously shift your focus to how rich people think. Remember, you can choose to think in ways that will support you in your happiness and success instead of ways that don't. A few caveats to begin. First, in no way, shape or form do I mean to degrade poor people or want to appear to be without compassion for their situation. I do not believe that rich people are better than poor people. They're just richer. At the same time, I want to make sure you get the message, so I'm going to make the distinctions between the rich and poor as extreme as possible. Second, when I discuss rich, poor, and middle-class people, what I'm referring to is their mentality, how different folks think and act, rather than the actual amount of money they've got or their value to society. Third, I will be generalizing big time. I understand that not all rich and not all poor people are the way I'm describing them to be. Again, my objective is to make sure you get the point of each principle and use it. Fourth, for the most part, I will not always be referring to the middle class specifically, because middle class people usually have a mix of rich and poor mentalities. Again, my goal is for you to become aware of where you fit on the scale 
and to think more like the rich if you want to create more wealth. Fifth, several of the principles in this section may appear to deal with more habits and actions than with ways of thinking. Remember, our actions come from our feelings which come from our thoughts. Consequently, every rich action is preceded by a rich way of thinking. Finally, I'm going to ask you to be willing to let go of being right. What I mean by that is, be willing to let go of having to do it your way. Why? Because your way has gotten you exactly what you've got right now. If you want more of the same, keep doing it your way. If you're not yet rich, however, maybe it's time you consider a different way, especially one that comes from someone who is really, really rich and has put thousands of others on the road to wealth too. It's up to you. The concepts you're about to learn are simple but profound. They make real changes for real people in the real world. How do I know? At my company, we get thousands of letters and emails each year telling us how each individual wealth file has transformed people's lives. If you learn them and use them, I am confident they will transform your life too. At the end of each section, you will find a declaration and a physical movement with which to anchor it into your body. You will also find actions to take to support you in adopting this wealth file. It is imperative you put each file into action in your life as quickly as possible so that the knowledge can move to a physical, cellular level and create lasting and permanent change. Most people understand we are creatures of habit. But what they don't realize is that there are actually two kinds of habits. Doing habits and not doing habits. Everything you are not doing right now, you are in the habit of not doing. The only way to change these not doing habits into doing habits is to do them. Reading will assist you, but it's a whole different world when you go from reading to doing. If you are truly serious about success, prove it and do the actions suggested. Wealth file number one. Rich people believe, I create my life. Poor people believe, life happens to me. If you want to create wealth, it is imperative that you believe that you are at the steering wheel of your life, especially your financial life. If you don't believe this, then you must inherently believe that you have little or no control over your life, and therefore you have little or no control over your financial success. That is not a rich attitude. Did you ever notice that it's usually poor people who spend a fortune playing the lottery? They actually believe their wealth is going to come from someone picking their name out of a hat. They spend Saturday night glued to the TV, excitingly watching the draw to see if wealth is going to land on them this week. Sure, everyone wants to win the lottery, and even rich people play for fun once in a while. But first, they don't spend half their paycheck on tickets. And second, winning the lotto is not their primary strategy for creating wealth. You have to believe that you are the one who creates your success, that you are the one who creates your mediocrity, and that you are the one creating your struggle around money and success. Consciously or unconsciously, it's still you. Instead of taking responsibility for what's going on in their lives, poor people choose to play the role of the victim. A victim's predominant thought is often, poor me. So, presto, by virtue of the law of intention, that's literally what victims get. They get to be poor. Notice that I said they play the role of victim. I didn't say they are victims. I don't believe anyone is a victim. I believe people play the victim because they think it gets them something. We'll discuss this in more detail shortly. That said, how can you tell when people are playing the victim? They leave three obvious clues. Now, before we talk about these clues, I want you to realize that I fully understand that none of these ways of being has anything to do with anyone reading this book. But maybe, just maybe, you might know someone who can relate. And maybe, just maybe, you might know that person intimately. Either way, I suggest you pay close attention to this section. Victim clue number one, blame. When it comes to why they're not rich, most victims are professionals at the blame game. The object of this game is to see how many people and circumstances you can point the finger at without ever looking at yourself. It's fun for victims, at least. Unfortunately, it's not such a blast for anyone else who is unlucky enough to be around them. That's because those in close proximity to victims become easy targets. 
Victims blame the economy. They blame the government. They blame the stock market. They blame their broker. They blame their type of business. They blame their employer. They blame their employees. They blame their manager. They blame the head office. They blame their upline or their downline. They blame customer service. They blame the shipping department. They blame their partner. They blame their spouse. They blame God. And of course, they always blame their parents. It's always someone else or something else that is to blame. The problem is anything or anyone but them. Victim clue number two, justifying. If victims aren't blaming, you'll often find them justifying or rationalizing their situation by saying something like, money's not really important. Let me ask you this question. If you said that your husband or your wife or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your partner or your friend weren't all that important, would any of them be around for long? I don't think so, and neither would money. At my live seminars, some participants always come up to me and say, you know, Harv, money's not really that important. I look them directly in the eyes and say, you're broke, right? They usually look down at their feet and meekly reply with something like, well, right now I'm having a few financial challenges, but I interrupt. No, it's not just right now, it's always. You've always been broke or close to it, yes or yes. At this point, they usually nod their head in agreement and woefully return to their seats, ready to listen and learn, as they finally realize what a disastrous effect this one belief has had on their lives. PPS. Check in as to how you feel before your commitment and how you feel after it. If you feel a sense of freedom, you're on your way. If you feel a tinge of fear, you're on your way. If you didn't bother doing it, you're still in not being willing to do whatever it takes mode or I don't need to do any of this weird stuff mode. Either way, let me remind you, your way has gotten you exactly where you are right now. Wealth file number four. Rich people think big, poor people think small. We once had a trainer teaching at one of our seminars who went from a net worth of $250,000 to over $600 million in only three years. When asked his secret, he said, everything changed the moment I began to think big. I refer you to the law of income, which states you will be paid in direct proportion to the value you deliver according to the marketplace. The key word is value. It's important to know that four factors determine your value in the marketplace supply, demand, quality, and quantity. In my experience, the factor that presents the biggest challenge for most people is the quantity. The quantity factor simply means how much of your value do you actually deliver to the marketplace. Another way of stating this is how many people do you actually serve or affect? In my business, for instance, some trainers prefer teaching small groups of 20 people at a time. Others are comfortable with 100 participants in the room. Others like an audience of 500 and still others love audiences of 1,000 to 5,000 or more. Is there a difference in income among these trainers? You better believe there is. Consider the network marketing business. Is there a difference in income between someone who has 10 people in his or her downline and someone who has 10,000 people? I would think so. Near the beginning of this book, I mentioned that I owned a chain of retail fitness stores. From the moment I even considered going into this business, my intention was to have 100 successful stores and affect tens of thousands of people. My competitor, on the other hand, who started six months after me, had the intention of owning one successful store. In the end, she earned a decent living. I got rich. How do you want to live your life? How do you want to play the game? Do you want to play in the big leagues or in the little leagues? In the majors or the minors? Are you going to play big or play small? It's your choice. Most people choose to play small. Why? First, because of fear. They're scared to death of failure, and they're even more frightened of success. Second, people play small because they feel small. They feel unworthy. They don't feel they're good enough or important enough to make a real difference in people's lives. But hear this. Your life is not just about you. It's also about contributing to others. It's about living true to your mission and reason for being here on this earth at this time. It's about adding your piece of the puzzle to the world. 
Most people are so stuck in their egos that everything revolves around me, me, and more me. But if you want to be rich in the truest sense of the word, it can't only be about you. It has to include adding value to other people's lives. One of the greatest inventors and philosophers of our time, Buckminster Fuller, said, The purpose of our lives is to add value to the people of this generation and those that follow. We each came to this earth with natural talents, things we're just naturally good at. These gifts were given to you for a reason, to use and share with others. Research shows that the happiest people are those who use their natural talents to the utmost. Part of your mission in life, then, must be to share your gifts and value with as many people as possible. That means being willing to play big. Do you know the definition of an entrepreneur? The definition we use in our program is a person who solves problems for people at a profit. That's right. An entrepreneur is nothing more than a problem solver. So I ask you, would you rather solve problems for more people or fewer people? If you replied more, then you need to start thinking bigger and decide to help massive numbers of people, thousands, even millions. The byproduct is that the more people you help, the richer you become, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and definitely financially. Make no mistake, every person on this planet has a mission. If you are living right now, there's a reason for it. Richard Bach, in his book, Jonathan Livingston Siegel, is asked, how will I know when I've completed my mission? The answer? If you are still breathing, you are not done. What I have witnessed is too many people not doing their job, not fulfilling their duty, or dharma as it's called in Sanskrit. I watch too many people playing far too small and too many people allowing their fear-based ego selves to rule them. The result is that too many of us are not living up to our full potential in terms of both our own lives and our contribution to others. It comes down to this, if not you, then who? Again, everyone has his or her unique purpose. Maybe you're a real estate investor and buy properties to rent them out and make money on cash flow and appreciation. What's your mission? How do you help? There's a good chance you add value to your community by helping families find affordable housing they may not otherwise be able to find. Now the question is how many families and people can you assist? Are you willing to help 10 instead of 1? 20 instead of 10? 100 instead of 20? This is what I mean by playing big. In her wonderful book, A Return to Love, author Marianne Williamson puts it this way. You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us. It is in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. The world doesn't need more people playing small. It's time to stop hiding out and start stepping out. It's time to stop needing and start leading. It's time to start sharing your gifts instead of hoarding them or pretending they don't exist. It's time you started playing the game of life in a big way. In the end, small thinking and small actions lead to being both broke and unfulfilled. Big thinking and big action lead to having both money and meaning. The choice is yours. Declaration. Place your hand on your heart and say, I think big. I choose to help thousands and thousands of people. Touch your head and say, I have a millionaire mind. Millionaire mind actions. 1. Write down what you believe to be your natural talents. These are things you've always been naturally good at. Also write down how and where you can use more of these gifts in your life and especially your work life. 2. Write down or brainstorm with a group of people how you can solve problems for 10 times the number of people you affect in your job or business now. Come up with at least three different strategies. Think leverage. Success story from Jim Rosemary. From Jim Rosemary to T. Harv Ecker. If someone had said to me I would have doubled my income and simultaneously doubled my time off, I would have said that was not possible. But that is exactly what has happened. 
In one year, our business grew 175%, and in that same year, we took a total of seven weeks of vacation time, much of that spent at additional peak potential seminars. This is astounding considering we had experienced minimal growth over the previous five years and struggled to get even two weeks of time off a year. As a result of knowing Harv Ecker and being involved with Peak Potentials, I have a deeper understanding of myself and a greater appreciation for the abundance in my life. My relationship with my wife and children has been immeasurably enhanced. I now see more opportunities than I ever thought possible. I feel that I truly am on the right path to success in all its facets. Wealth File Number 5 Rich people focus on opportunities. Poor people focus on obstacles. Rich people see opportunities. Poor people see obstacles. Rich people see potential growth. Poor people see potential loss. Rich people focus on the rewards. Poor focus on the risks. It comes down to the age-old question, is the glass half empty or half full? We're not talking about positive thinking here. We're talking about your habitual perspective on the world. Poor people make choices based upon fear. Their minds are constantly scanning for what is wrong or could go wrong in any situation. Their primary mindset is, what if it doesn't work? Or more often, it won't work. Middle class people are slightly more optimistic. Their mindset is, I sure hope this works. Rich people, as we've said earlier, take responsibility for the results in their lives and act upon the mindset, it will work because I'll make it work. Rich people expect to succeed. They have confidence in their abilities, they have confidence in their creativity, and they believe that should the doo-doo hit the fan, they can find another way to succeed. Generally speaking, the higher the reward, the higher the risk. Because they constantly see opportunity, rich people are willing to take a risk. Rich people believe that, if worse comes to worst, they can always make their money back. Poor people, on the other hand, expect to fail. They lack confidence in themselves and in their abilities. Poor people believe that should things not work out, it would be catastrophic. And because they constantly see obstacles, they are usually unwilling to take a risk. No risk, no reward. For the record, being willing to risk doesn't necessarily mean that you are willing to lose. Rich people take educated risks. This means that they research, do their due diligence, and make decisions based on solid information and facts. 